I've been here in India for the last five months, uh, researching on the Fulbright Research Grant uh, on environments of the poor and political ecology in Telangana in Hyderabad. And I'm, uh, it was a it was a happenstance that I happened to meet uh, Professor uh, Purushottam Reddigaru through uh, Mr. B. V. Subarao. Uh, we had had several uh, occasions where I met with him at the Center for uh, Cultural Resources and Training. Uh, I have met him at other venues. Uh, it's, he's been an inspiration for many and I have learned about his work in the last few months. And I say this with great humility that uh, uh, he has uh, a noble and uh, very uh, basic understanding of what's happening in, in the field of not just environment, but I have rarely met a public intellectual uh, like Professor uh, Redigaru uh, over the years, in my 20 some years in the United States. Uh, he, for me, is a not only an intellectual but also a political theorist, philosopher, and very pragmatic approach towards uh, issues on the ground uh, related to environment and uh, climate change. So my my humble, uh, you know, uh, gesture here is that you know uh, I am lucky to meet with uh, Professor Reddy Garu and also many others who are here. Um, uh, Lakshman Reddy Garu and Mrs. Mr. Lakshman Reddy Garu and uh, Dante Narsima Reddy Garu and many others, Dilip Reddy. Uh, I had the occasion to be on a panel. Uh, Dr. Sai Bhaskar has been you know, one important person with whom I've been communicating. And many others, I might forget the names here, but uh, on the drive here, I was you know, talking to uh, Professor Prabhakar Reddy, sir, and you know, we had a very important exchange of ideas. Uh, I think. Uh, uh, the big question for me as a student, uh, as a student and scholar, is you know learning about environmental issues in Hyderabad. Uh, I've been in Tennessee working, uh, researching in uh, different areas of uh, uh, endeavor, expertise of uh, young people's involvement, media literacy, media engagement with UN, UNESCO, uh, UN workshops I had attended. But I focused on environment because I saw firsthand uh, some of the implications of uh, environmental issues with my students in Tennessee, first generation students who come from working class backgrounds from rural areas, particularly from the Smoky Mountains and the rural, uh, as they're called as the Appalachians, the great Appalachians, coal mining uh, areas in Tennessee. Uh, many of the working class youth are from uh, people of color, people, you know, African Americans, people, white people, uh, all people from all backgrounds class as a barrier to their, you know, first generation students. So that actually informed my early understanding of uh, civic participation. But I saw that environment was a common uh, thematic, that you know, they live in poor neighborhoods, they lived in, they were living in, still do live in, uh, where they don't have access to drinking water, clean drinking water, they don't have access to basic amenities that we in the middle classes and upper middle class take for granted. And I saw similarities with Telangana. My, I grew up in India, I grew up in Hyderabad, I was born in Hyderabad. So I'm from here, I'm from uh, the old city of Hyderabad, from the new city of Hyderabad where I grew up. Uh, so uh, I would like to uh, just acknowledge the fact that uh, my uh, work, you know, I, when I met with Purushottam Redigaru, I always remembered his uh, motto that society as a lab, you know, social theory, <coughs> philosophy, you can talk about concepts and theories in the abstract, but if they are not grounded, uh, in people's experiences, they don't matter anymore. So I learned that idea of uh, society as lab and I was visiting Bastis for the last five months, uh, set, squatter settlements in old city, new city, uh, particularly in Yusufuda, Sri Ramnagar colony, in old city parts of Tala Pattar they are called, and also Talab Katta near the, near the Biradam tank. Uh, then I you know, went to Jawahar Nagar uh, dump yard and the Miyapu dump yard and also Kundapur area. Uh, and uh, learning with interacting with uh, people from the working class backgrounds, looking at solid waste issues, looking at water pollution, looking at land issues, uh, and also at the University of Hyderabad, where I taught uh, advanced PhD in theory with my students, and we went right into the campus. Uh, instead of just reading in the classroom, we went into the campus, and today I will talk a little bit about that. I just wanted to uh, begin with those few comments here. Uh, before I start uh, with today's talk, I uh, just wanted to give you an idea that, you know, 
uh, when I say Earth ontologies uh, and uh, the human finitude, the idea of the human finitude is a philosophical problem. In Western philosophy, particularly with Martin Heidegger and others, uh, the idea of finitude being that uh, human uh, life is, uh, there is a great deal of fragility and it is uh, not perpetual. We are all here for a limited time. Our human arc is about 70, 80, 90 years, whatever it is. But the human finitude is that we are always looking at death. Even Hegel and others in Western philosophy talk about the moment you are born, you are always confronting your death. And that itself is something that not just Western philosophy has given us, but existentialism of Jacques Paul Sartre, for instance, he talked about the nothingness, being in nothingness. That something is crucial to the way in which they have conceptualized and theorized uh, philosophy in the West. But today I'm going to talk about how in the indigenous uh, thought process, indigenous communities, whether in South America, Latin America, or elsewhere in Africa, it has always been there with us, the human finitude. And even in our great uh, tradition, Indic culture, uh, if you remember, uh, the Brihad Aranyaka Upanishad talks about the great wilderness of the forests. Uh, it's a great Sanskrit you know, text, it's a philological text, it's scriptural uh, ideas, but these are things that actually have transformed the way in which we understand our own role, our own position in the world. So today uh, we will look at uh, some of the ways in which you know, uh, diverse philosophies have interconnected uh, and we look at how environment and climate change can be uh, better understood or better theorized. I will talk not only in abstract, but I'll try to bring the concepts on the ground and try to look at some of those issues. Uh, I grew up uh, when my dad, I, my dad passed away when I was nine years old. And I remember that, you know, he was a Arya Samajist. He would talk about some of the Upanishads and more of a, in a way of a, not the ritual view of religion, but more of a contemporary, the Adhunik. He would always remember as a kid, I would remember that he would say that you need to connect the Adhunik. Don't talk about the past so much. So the idea of uh, Swami Dharayanan Saraswati, he imbibed with him. But I was always an agnostic. I was always questioning. So I have that understanding of the world in which you know we all live today and I will share and you all have great knowledge about uh, not just the uh, theological and philosophical issues in religion, not just Hinduism, but different diverse religions, but also broader social understanding of our own place in the world. So I would stop here and I would begin with a <coughs> clip of a documentary. It's a five minute clip uh, on the Anthropocene. And I would like to, you know, you guys to view that, watch it, and we will continue. The Anthropocene is time in the geological record when humans have moved the planet outside its natural limits. Humans go from being participants in the whole Earth to being a dominant feature. Dominating the oceans, the landscape, the agriculture, animals. It could be a full scale of a sun scale. We have not our way together. We live now in a different world. It is such a fundamental change in the way that we communicate that as powerful as possible to everybody.
that was living in the US that we in the West, we in the US and other parts of the way. I teach a class on uh, environment and climate change and its effects, you know, particularly with regard to young people. Uh, we watched the uh, documentary. It's about 19 minute documentary. That's a trailer of the documentary and I would uh, uh, urge you to watch it. Uh, a couple of things here that I would like to mention. The idea of the Anthropocene. Uh, it seems, you know, in particularly in geology and earth sciences, uh, they, and all of you know about it, are familiar with it, that there has been extensive research in the last 15-20 years that uh, climatologists and other scientists have said that we have moved from Holocene to Anthropocene, where Anthropos is human, man, human. Uh, so the first time in uh, recorded history that we humans have begun to shift the earth, as it says, outside its natural limits. So we are making an impact. And I would like to read before we move forward here, uh, a quote from uh, Yuval Noah Harari, uh, his book from the Homo sapiens. And I just wanted to mention the kind of thing that we have achieved in the last short span of time. And I quote from his work, the quote begins, other animals at the top of the pyramid, such as lions and sharks, evolved into that position very gradually over millions of years. This enables the ecosystem to develop checks and balances that prevent lions and sharks from wreaking too much havoc. As the lions became deadlier, so gazelles evolved to run faster, hyenas to cooperate better and rhinoceroses to be more bad tempered. In contrast, Humankind ascended to the top so quickly that the ecosystem was not given much time to adjust." Unquote. This was uh, Yuval uh, Noah Harari in 2015. So one can begin to see the effects of uh, human encroachment on the environment. Now to the topic itself, uh, earth ontologies and uh, human finitude. Uh, Ontology is a, again, within the philosophy, you have you know, epistemology, metaphysics, and there is a shift from epistemology, knowledge, to ontology. Uh, much of what uh, we understand in Western philosophy, René Descartes' uh, dualism, that is, you know, the subject object dualism, uh, has given way to a conquest of nature with Francis Bacon and others that, you know, they talk about how we need to wrest the secrets out of nature, that our relationship with nature, our relationship with the environment, is one of domination that has been you know, written about in the past seven years and particularly modern philosophy with René Descartes as its progenitor has been you know, one of uh, dualism. Recent 50-60 uh, years back, uh, as I said to you, Heidegger and others have moved from uh, and even before that, you know, uh, uh, Emerson, uh, uh, the American pragmatist, you know, Waldo Emerson and Thoreau and others have written about it. They're drawing from Bhagavad Gita, the in Hindu text Gita and other religious you know, discourses and beginning to understand the world in a much more broader sense. And so uh, William James and other pragmatists in American school of pragmatic philosophy uh, began to engage with the indigenous traditions also. William James is famous for doing that with the native Indians in the United States, uh, particularly the, uh, they were called the, uh, if I remember the term correctly, the uh, elk, the, the black elk and others, you know, that their wisdom that is gleaned from the ground. Wisdom not in terms of writing uh, theories in the abstract, but from the ground, indigenous traditions. And similarly, there was an exchange of ideas from the great Sanskritic traditions from India. Hinduism, particularly that ideas of, you know, whether Upanishads or Vedas or even the, the whole idea of the way in which the uh, self, self as, you know, something like Atman and, you know, the idea of the conceptualized. Uh, found its way into the Western uh, philosophy. So there is, in a way, uh, great uh, sort of upheaval in, in philosophical systems, and particularly Heidegger and others began to move from epistemology to ontology. Ontology as in sense of body, as an embodiment, how we relate ourselves to nature, more holistic way. And that ontology is, you know, with Marlu Ponty and others, uh, they were the people who were reading Heidegger, Paul Ricoeur, for instance, you know, I'm talking about the French philosophers here, even Michel Foucault and, you know, uh, Deleuze and Guattari and uh, non-Western uh, thought, religious and philosophical thought. 
So people have written about it. I am not saying something new here, but you know, people have written about it. So that is the reason why I, when I say uh, Earth ontologies, I am looking at the way in which Earth, people have talked about Earth as a living being. Earth is something on the move constantly. If you look at the great uh, uh, layers of the Earth, particularly in the geological sense of its uh, understanding, that you will see that the strata, as we call the strata, and it's a scientific study of the Earth, uh, Earth's crust and you know, Earth's uh, development over billions of years. What you see is that it is always constantly forming. So it is not something non-living, it is living, Earth is living. The plants, the trees, the bacteria that we talk about today you know, have billions of years of existence. So it is in a way, ontology is something that we need to frame uh, environmentalism in that sense and we should not worry about isms of like environmentalism, ideological systems uh, but environment in a more broader sense like for example in Hindi Sanskrit there is a term called Paryavaran. Paryavaranam. Parya means something that is surrounding us. We are all surrounded by the environment which is environing us and uh, also we are embedded in it. So we talk about the natural environment the social environment. So you need to have a broader holistic way of approaching it. And the theories and philosophies don't give you so much. Uh, they, you may have concepts and ideas, but really want to engage with that. You have to do that. That's why we talk about, you know, how we can sort of connect with the ground. Where we bring students and bring people and, you know, look at the uh, natural setting, look at the rocks and other kinds of things that are part of the landscape, both above the ground and underneath the ground. So, uh, you all heard of uh, James Lovelock and this is a beautiful earth center here. I came here for the first time and while I was driving here, I was amazed at the beauty of the, my own land, our own land. It's a beautiful place, Kartal and you know, as we were driving in, uh, I saw the rocks and you know, I was beginning to think about, you know, Elizabeth Pominelli wrote there was a piece called, a uh, journal article called, a book later, there's an Australian scholar called, Do Rocks Listen? Do Rocks Listen? they have a sense of understanding of the world. Just think about the way in which the rocks are looking at us. And rocks carry ages of history with them. History in a long geological sense. So James Lovelock, his, uh, he passed away in 2022. Uh, the Gaia Hypothesis, the book that he wrote with the brilliant uh, American biologist Lynn Margulis called The Gaia Hypothesis. Gaia as in the, in the Greek, the mother goddess. And in uh, English also, mater, mother, mater, matter is also like related to ma, mother. So you can see that it's more of a holistic sense, not as epistemology, but as an ontology or in the plural ontologies. So for instance, uh, what did uh, James Lovelock tell us? He told us that the earth is a self-regulating system maintained by communities of living organisms, which uh, Yuval Noah Harari talks about in his brilliant book, uh, The Homo Sapiens, and uh, also uh, our own text, uh, The Brihad Aranyaka, or the Chandogya talks about it, in the, the theoretical concepts uh, within Hindu philosophy, you know, the idea of the Atman and, you know, the afterlife and all of those concepts, which are rich, which actually rich and generative concepts to really think about the way we can talk about environment. Now, I'm just moving a little bit here between, you know, to connect with the ontology and the human finitude. Uh, Antonio Damasio, uh, the Portuguese uh, neuroscientist, talked about how uh, even the single cell creatures, the bacteria that lived on the planet, even much before us, millions and billions of years, billions of years back, they uh, didn't have a well developed nervous system, but they do have a sense of understanding. They would move from one, put one point in space to the other, hence the geography, media and, and environment. I will also talk about the whole idea of geography. So creatures like the single cell bacteria or even the single cell protoplasm, early you know, piece of jelly-like substance, it moves, it feeds the heat. So it would move from hot to cold region. So Damasio is working with uh, scientific ideas. He's a neuroscientist. And he says that uh, they behave intelligently, bacteria, even though they don't have a mind, like human beings have a mind and a nervous system. And they have been on the earth for billions of years, predating us, you know, preceding the humans regulating capacities of the, you know, the body and all that. So what I'm basically saying, drawing from social theory and philosophy is that one cannot really look at the world in terms of a very purely instrumental ways. Instrumental, like dominating the nature and dominating, as you see in the Anthropocene, you know, of course, it refers to the West and uh, the overconsumption of, you know, uh, 
uh, goods and you know services and how we sort of begin to make an impact. But even in a place like Telangana, for instance, the development that is happening in five months I've been here, I saw that there's a great pressure on land, on water, two crucial elements that sustain life, and the way we have monetized it, and the way in which we have actually degraded, degraded our landscapes, degraded our natural environment. So uh, Antonio Damasio talks about that. And also uh, recent scholarship by Nakul Deshpande from University of California, Berkeley and other places talks about how the dirt, the sand path, the dirt inside the ground always is throbbing with life, always on the move. And uh, it actually is shown through research. It's there online, you can read it, it's, you know, that it is uh, something that uh, even if you look at the world around us, thinking that it is a non-living uh, part of the landscape. It's, there is something, life is already there. So we cannot divide living and non-living in the dualistic sense of a Descartes, but we want to understand it in a more holistic way. And that would be the uh, idea of the Earth ontologies. Earth as something that is moving. Now, media and uh, uh, geography. I, I could have said geology instead of geography, because geology is what the field has given us the idea of the Anthropocene, and there's a, a lot of research that is being done in the field of geology today that uh, in the name of the earth sciences, they call the earth systems. So my view would be that not to look at disciplines in the, uh, in the, as silos, but disciplines in a broader perspective, like anthropology, political science, philosophy, sociology, geology, all of these and sciences and you know, the social sciences have a common program that you need to have a transdisciplinary approach. That is the reason why UNESCO and UN has begun to really look at a transdisciplinary perspective on environment and climate change. These are not just mere words. People like uh, Manuel Delanda, Manuel Delanda talks about a thousand years of non-linear history. He says the mineralization of the world, the mineralization of the world, the minerals that are in the ground, we were all minerals at one point of time or the other. He says actually there is a term here, he says we are walking uh, we are walking uh, minerals, walking and talking minerals. Uh, life is a kind of a higher order minerality. Uh, Elizabeth Gross talks about it and she recalls Lynn Margulis, I talked about the Gaia hypothesis with uh, James Lovelock and uh, others who were looking at the Russian geochemist Vladimir Vladatsky who uh, said that we, as quoting him, we are all walking, talking minerals. Or in the words of Pavinari, we were also rocks and sediments before we, we settled into this mode of existence. So it is not new, meaning we talk about that in the Western philosophy, but it is there in the indigenous traditions of thought, thousands of years back. Native Indian traditions in, uh, in the Americas, when I say Americas, not just North America, but also Mexico, South America, but also in uh, uh, the great traditions of the Indic culture, of the great tradition of the Persians in, in, the, in the Middle East. Uh, or the Far East, uh, the Chinese traditions, we have more of a holistic approach. And how do we reclaim that? It's not just a mere shift from epistemology to ontology, but what you are doing here, my little understanding of the Center for Council for Green Revolution and also the Eastern Ghats that I read, Professor Redika gave me the book, I was reading that with great interest. I was looking up the website of the Earth Center uh, last couple of days. What you all are doing, I think, and this morning I appreciate your Although you had a formal first formal meeting, but I was allowed to sit there and listen to you all. Uh, it, it is remarkable that you know you are envisioning that and developing that. I remember uh, years back uh, at the Rachel Carson Center in Boston. Uh, they have similar. Uh, Rachel Carson Center is actually more uh, inclined towards having the research and uh, with people getting PhDs and uh, master <coughs> students to do research, basic research in the sense of live research going and meeting the communities, pretty much what we all do here, you all do here, in terms of meeting with the communities, with the farmers, with the working class youth, children and young people, and interacting with them and trying to build knowledge by doing things. In Tennessee, I had my son go to a school called the Farm School, which had in Summertown, Tennessee, where they do, they imbibe ideas of Mahatma Gandhi, uh, of uh, other religious leaders, MLK, Martin Luther King and others, and they imbibe that spirit of doing things on the ground, uh, living together in cooperatives, uh, not really having a certain relationship with property, 
you know, property relationships are built into the American ethos, like John Locke and others, you know, talk about property as a way, as a key way of individualism, extreme individualism. Highly, you know, extremely hyper individualism leads to that, that kind of a capitalism that is a detrimental to nature. That's why somebody else mentioned that we are not in, not just in an age of Anthropocene, they said we are in an age of a capitalocene. Fossil fuels began, right? Fossil fuels in 1700. So, uh, Timothy mentioned and others wrote a book called uh, Carbon Democracy. Carbon Democracy. It's a fascinating book. Uh, if you read that, you will get some insights. We don't read books, right? Just to sort of in from top down, but we try to engage with them at our own levels. So, what I'm saying is that the Earth Center here uh, could be a, a great example for in the in not just to follow through or you know look like the Rachel Carson but to build uh, interconnections with the scientific community uh, Rachel Carson center does that with the sciences national institute of health uh, in the united states nih national uh, science foundation nsf center for disease control in atlanta they have uh, programs for young uh, scholars in, at the masters level itself and uh, even for high schools to popularize science, to make science popular as a way in which to understand the world and through scientific know-how and knowledge, genuine science, uh, understanding that and also building social theory and humanities into it and to approach the world in a very pragmatic way, in a holistic way. And I think, you know, what uh, uh, Delanda and I mentioned Elizabeth Povinelli, uh, uh, Mahatma Gandhi is a, is a great example also in that sense. The idea of uh, Swaraj and the, his concepts, which are gleaned from, in some way or the other, all of us are influenced by uh, the Gita uh, and other texts, other religious texts, not just Hindus, but also among uh, other communities who live in India, Muslims and you know, Christians and Zoroastrians and Sikhs and others, whoever, whatever religious denomination we come from. Uh, there is a great deal to learn from. That is why they uh, recently, Amitav Ghosh wrote the book called the Nutmeg's Curse, in that book he mentioned, and even before that, The Green Derangement, uh, Climate Change and the Unthinkable, he mentioned that we need to connect with the religious uh, uh, religious institutions, religious organizations, also to disseminate ideas of climate change, effects of climate on, on all of us here. Media itself here, I would conclude with a few comments here, I don't want to take, I would like to enjoy your conversation with Q and A question and answers and dialogue rather than speak here. I want to mention that media itself, uh, recently I went to the University of Hyderabad, we did three weeks of uh, intense reading with students, PhD students. Then I went with them on the ground, we visited the campus, 2000 plus, uh, 2800 acres of land, University of Hyderabad. We went with our cell phones and you know, uh, and we visited the place and we talked about geomedia, there is a theory called geomedia, echo media, there are other kinds of people who are writing about it and we looked at the ground. We talked about the way in which the flora and the fauna in the University of Hyderabad is affected by uh, effluents that are flowing in from the outside, chemicals that from the Telangana Medical School is coming in from the Institute of Business to into the no man's land to into University of Hyderabad. And how the land also has been land grabbing in certain parts of the University of Hyderabad. So you can see the degradation of the environment and trying to build in the students, not a, just a philosophical understanding, but to look at the, uh, the at environment in its broader perspective. So we went and looked at the uh, peacocks, we looked at the, uh, the deer, the insects, the birds, all of that, and we sort of documented, we spoke to each other, we engaged with a kind of a uh, collaboration there, exercise there, and we went to the school, to the classroom outside, <coughs> into the nature, and that was a, excellent understanding of how both the professor and the students learn. I learn a great deal from my students and they understand my student was from Balagunda, Balakrishna, he's talked about Florin and you know how fluoride has affected his family and another student from Kerala, he was talking about the whole host of issues in Kerala and we engaged with them. I was learning from them, they were learning from the books and we were trying to understand the world in a better way. So we talked about the ontologies, of the earth ontologies there and we try to shift it, the focus there. So that's, the, I think, the nature of the things that you guys will be doing here. Uh, and I know that you know, the Earth Center is something which, you know, uh, would, uh, in the years to come, uh, would be at the forefront, uh, not just in Telangana, but other, other parts of India, being an inspiration to them. So 
geography, uh, media as in its broader sensibility and uh, environment also. There is a linkage between the three. And in my studies in the last five uh, months, uh, I have picked up a lot of uh, reading materials, I have picked up documents, uh, interacting with the officials uh, in Telangana, looking at how uh, we can build uh, practical, pragmatic programs, uh, training modules to implement and you know, look at the middle school and high school, in, in not just in English but in Telugu and in Hindi and other languages, in Urdu, in, in Hyderabad and Telangana, to inculcate in the students. Because students have a great deal of curiosity uh, about just not just about nature and things around them, wonder and sense of wonder, but also in this hyper uh, competitive world. Uh, they also worry about their own livelihoods and their own, you know, uh, as they're growing older and trying to become, you know, uh, the citizens. Uh, to sort of, in that sense, you know, I've been, you know, uh, teaching and I'm learning from, uh, learning from a whole range of people here. So schools would be uh, the place where we begin to really uh, expand the idea of geography and geology as a much more comprehensive term and media in a broader sense. And I will talk to you guys about media. Uh, if you have any, you know, Q and A sessions, we will have a dialogue, and uh, environment also needs broader sensibility. So I think, you know, with that, I would like to uh, conclude. But I would like to mention one thing about uh, this whole idea of the cell phone itself. You know, uh, already, you know, people like uh, uh, people have looked at the digital media, and we have all the interesting <coughs> ideas about things digital, right? But this cell phone itself is a is a connected with the earth minerals, right? Meaning very rare earth minerals are there. There is a lot of labor that has gone into it. Child labor, for, for instance, e-waste and digital waste. All of that goes into this. This is not just, I tell my students, this is not something that you will uh, to use as a you know, user engagement, participation, and young people involved in all kinds of social networking sites, you know, privatized corporate social networking sites. The other day I mentioned the same. These are neither social nor they are media. The social networking sites, the Facebooks, the Snapchats, the Twitters, the Instagrams. So the digital artifact that we have in our hands is in fact a bundle of contradictions. It is in a, some sense of a deep time of the planet. They talk about the deep time now, not the time of our human time, right? Our clock time. Deep time is a time of geology. It's over billions of years. The earth that formed here in Deccan. There's a theory called the Deccan Traps. You might have read about it. Deccan Traps that 65 million years back, there were four huge volcanic eruptions in the Deccan, the place where we are today, uh, from the plateau, from the eastern western Ghats to Krishna, Godavari, and down Satara, and Mumbai, and much of Telangana. That the earth, that crust of the earth that formed and joined together uh, is made of the basalt rocks. The basalt rocks are the crust of the earth, that the rocks that we find today in Telangana. And these are the not just mute, they are alive. The rocks around here, they are alive, they are speaking to us and we don't know their language but they know, they have seen the witness to the degradation of the environment from our the human encroachment. So the, the digital materials, they have history of labor and political economy uh, that is connected with the deep time of the planet and it some way is very obscene to really you know, uh, think of this as an advancement in communications, communications in the sense of uh, dialogue and dissemination. It might enable that network of horizontal communication, but this itself is made up of rare, rare earth minerals, which are extracted with great impunity in, in uh, Ivory Coast, in, in Ghana, other parts of the world where young people, children are actually taking apart, not only extracting the minerals, raw minerals, but also taking apart the computer devices and others that are discarded. And they travel from the United States and Europe into China, into India, parts of you know, other parts of the world. So there is that sensibility in which you know, we talk about devices of media as uh, enabling us, which are not, in some senses, you know, these are actually causing more damage to the environment. As we speak today, if you measure the other day, uh, I uh, li listened to uh, Dr. Narsimha Reddy's uh, talk on the Sahaja Vanurula uh, presentation that he said that GDP, you know, you need to put in the measuring the GDP in terms of climate effect on climate and climate change and all that, we need to first measure the effect of impact of media, all media, the energy that is expenditure of energy that goes into this particular media, the effects on the environment, the toxic elements, the effects on people's lives, all of that, you need to sort of incorporate in our studies. 
So media in that sense I am referring to here is not just the institutions of broadcasting and digital media, but also media in the broader sense, the petri dish as a media, in the bacteria that is forming, the earth as a media. The earth is the greatest medium of all. Isaac Newton began to talk about medium theory, medium theory Newton and before that philologists like Leo Spitzer and others talked about it. So media for me is a broader understanding, both organic it will also include institutions of broadcasting, but we need to be careful as to how we apply the term because it means a lot. The rock itself, there's a lot that is happening in nature. The creatures that are there under the rock. There is a philosopher called Albert uh, Northhead White, Whitehead. He says that the rock is prehending. When we say we are apprehending, the rock is prehending. Prehending in the sense that there is a rock there and there is a little squirrel that goes and sits on the rock. The squirrel is not coveting. The squirrel is just waiting and trying to eat its little fruit and it will run away to its play. But we human beings are always in some ways coveting something. We are sort of desirous creatures. We desire something more than our you know, satisfaction of the basic needs. So I think uh, in the end what I would like to suggest is that in the spirit of Earth Center and the CGRI and also uh, the grace the organization that we have here. Uh, I would be delighted to be part of it and I would be want to continue my, uh, continue my journey and also learn from you all and also have students uh, perhaps from the US come visit here and students from our own uh, Telangana region, Hyderabad region learn from each other and try to build a more holistic understanding of climate and, and environment. Thank you so much. I appreciate it.